Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Today I'm going to preach on one of those passages that can easily set people on edge. When you bring up the last half of Ephesians chapter 5 in a room full of Bible scholars or theologians, you start to see jaw muscles clench and neck veins start to show up. Because this is one of those passages that has troubled people, that has unfortunately at times divided people, as it talks about husbands and wives and their proper Christian relation to one another. So you could ask, why preach on a passage that has been known to divide people, particularly when only a certain portion of the people listening to that message are themselves married? Many, as our children's sermon demonstrated, are not yet married. Many have been married, and that marriage has ended, either through death or divorce. And some God has never called into marriage. So why spend a Sunday sermon preaching on marriage? Well, the simple answer is, it's in Scripture. And if it's in Scripture, and you're working your way through Ephesians, you kind of have to deal with the second half of chapter 5. But that's the simple answer. The richer answer is we believe that all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. Regardless of what it's addressing, we believe that Scripture delivers Christ to us. So whether you're married or not married today, I encourage you to listen up as this passage teaches us about Christ and about His church and about husbands and wives. Because whether you are a husband or wife, or whether you simply know people who are married, this teaching is a powerful witness to who Christ is and what he does in our lives. Now, they advise anybody who talks on a divisive topic to first make sure that you maximize the area that you hold in common, the areas that are not disagreed about. So let's start there. Because we're addressing the topic of marriage, which is certainly a cultural hot button right now. And we're addressing the topic of relationships between genders, which has been a cultural hot button for at least 40 years. So let's stress what we all can agree on. We can all agree that men and women are different and that men and women are the same. In some ways, they are different, other things they have in common. For instance, no one can deny men and women are physically different. And men and women are physically different because our bodies produce some different proteins and some different chemicals in some different proportions. And our bodies do that because we have differences genetically. So there are differences between men and women. I don't think anybody would argue with anything I've said so far. But also, there are incredible similarities. In fact, the similarities outnumber the differences. There may be a few organs that are different between the male body and the female body, but most of them are identical. There may be a few proteins and chemicals that are produced in different proportions, but most of them are the same. And yes, there are a couple of chromosomes that are different, but most are identical. So we have this basis of sameness, and then within that basis of sameness, there are distinctions. There are differences. And the sameness, the similarities, certainly outnumber the differences. Therefore... It should not surprise us that we're almost to the end of the book of Ephesians before Paul even introduces the idea of male and female. Up until now, every word that he said applies equally to male or female. Male or female, believers in Christ were chosen in Christ before time began. Male or female, we have been saved by grace through faith. This not of ourselves, it's a gift from God. Male or female, we have been united across all racial and ethnic lines. Male or female, Christ has shown us his infinite love, which knows neither height nor depth nor length nor breadth. Male or female, we have been instructed to put off the old and put on the new. And male or female, we have been told that we are to walk as children of the light. It's only now that Paul is going to introduce any distinction between males and females as he addresses husbands and wives. And therefore, it should not surprise us that he actually starts by once again emphasizing what is the same. Bible authors have to put in these little divisions somewhere, otherwise it looks like way too much text. But if you look in your Bible, I don't think any Bible scholar disagrees that verse 21, 
which came actually right before the passage that Rob read for us earlier, is really the heading for everything that follows in chapter 5. So once again, Paul is stressing what is the same, as in verse 21 he says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So we can add this to the list of similarities between men and women, that we are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's only then that Paul introduces a distinction, gives his instructions to different groups. And, being a gentleman, ladies first, he first addresses the wives and says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Those verses make anybody a little bit uncomfortable? I can understand if they do. Those verses are not ones that are often ones that the church will lead with. I've never seen these verses on any promotional material for any church. <laughs> Probably rightly so. But they're there, in black and white. So what do we do with those verses? They, they make us uneasy, at least I think in part, if not in large part, because it seems like we're making women vulnerable to mistreatment and abuse and neglect. And I'm sorry to say, and willing to apologize on behalf of the church at large, that there have been women in abusive relationships who were told that it's their job to submit to their husband because he's her head. That's a misuse of scripture. Women are told to submit to their husbands as to the Lord, just as the church submits to Christ. So let me ask you, when the church submits to Christ, is it subjecting itself to mistreatment? Is it subjecting itself to abuse? To neglect? Absolutely not. Christ describes the church as his bride, and Christ is the perfect bridegroom. So we can put that fear aside. Women are not being told to allow themselves to be victims. But they are being told to submit to their husbands the way that the church submits to Christ. So let's talk a little bit about what that means. Except that's not what Paul does. Paul leaves it right there and goes then to address the husbands. And women, if this made you feel uneasy, I hope it comforts you to know the husband's instruction is much harder. Listen to the words to the husband. Husbands, love your wives. Now, at first blush, it seems like husbands got off easy. I mean, couldn't the husband, in theory, hopefully, I, I know that none of you would do this, but couldn't the husband, in theory, just kick up his heels and sit on the couch all day and eat chicken and drink beverages and, and say, well, I love my wife, I'm fulfilling this command. Well, the wife is supposed to submit? No. That's not the love that's being discussed, and Paul makes that plain. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And in case you missed the implications of what that means, and gave himself up for her. Husbands are to love wives the way that Christ loved the church. And the reason that we're gathered here on any Sunday is because Christ's love was selfless and sacrificial. He was God himself, and yet he came down from heaven humbled himself, taking on the nature of a man, humbled himself even to the point of death on a cross. Jesus made it plain, whoever would be first in the kingdom of God must become last, and whoever wishes to be Lord of all must first be servant to all. That's what authority looks like in God's kingdom. That's what leadership looks like in God's kingdom. You don't sit there in the position of authority, insisting that everyone else submit to you, cater to your every whim, and make you feel good. Authority in God's kingdom is used for the sole purpose of serving, of lowering yourself down to the point of the lowliest servant in order to lift up the one who is loved, just as Christ has done that for each of us. Thanks be to God. We could not earn our salvation. He gave it to us as a free gift. He made himself the lowest of all servants in order to present us as his church in splendor without spot or wrinkle, holy and without blemish. Husbands, this is your instruction. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. That is a difficult order, isn't it? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands 
of how many of you husbands feel that you're perfectly capable of doing this, because the number of hands up after I ask that question ought to be the same number of hands that's up right now. None. No human can fulfill this instruction. Nor, I would argue, can a wife submit herself to her husband without Christ's enabling it. That's why this section comes when Paul is making plain to us how it is that we are to put off the old self and put on the new. How it is that we are to walk as children of the light. You want to know how to put your faith into action as a testimony to all the world? Look to your marriage. And Paul doesn't stop with marriage. Unfortunately, because of the way the lectionary is divided, we're not going to read the first portion of chapter 6. But Paul takes the same pattern of the authority figure using that authority to serve and the one who is under authority using that position to support and respect. Paul applies this same pattern then to parents and children. Children are to honor their parents. Parents, do not exasperate your children. Paul then applies it to masters and servants, or in today's terminology, bosses and employees. Bosses, masters, people in authority, use that authority to serve those who have been placed under your authority. People who are under authority, use that position to support, to respect, to honor. This is a beautiful symmetry, by the way. Picture a marriage where this happens. Where the husband loves his wife the way that Christ has loved the church and lays down his life for her. And where the wife supports and respects the husband. If the husband does his job, it makes it easier for the wife to do hers. Which makes it easier for the husband to do his job. Which makes it easier for the wife to do hers. You see the incredible pattern, the symmetry, the beauty of what Paul is describing here? It's the same with parents and children. Children, honor your parents. It makes it easier. And parents, don't exasperate your children. It makes their job easier, too. Bosses, care for your workers. Workers, respect and honor your bosses. This is where the rubber meets the road. It's not necessarily here in, our room, in this room where we celebrate receiving Christ's absolution again or His body and blood on a communion Sunday or His baptism. Those are incredible gifts, but where the rubber meets the road, where our faith really hits the real world, those moments when we are challenged to put off the old self and put on the new, the clearest demonstration of walking as children of the light doesn't happen in here. Anybody can fake it for an hour. It happens out in our marriages, out in our families, our relations with our children or with our parents, out in the workplace, our relationships with our employees or our bosses. This is where we walk as children of the light. This is where our lives bear testimony to that incredible gift that we have received in Christ. With the pattern that he has given us of sacrificial love and loving sacrifice. It's an incredible honor. And the first relationship that he holds up as a demonstration is the marriage. Followed then by the family and by the workplace. The person in a position of authority submits themselves, serves. The person who is under authority loves and respects. And so you get this beautiful description then in, in verse 33. I would translate it just a little bit differently than it's translated here. Because I think a more direct reading would say, However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, in order that the wife shall respect the husband. There's a little word there that means in order that, that doesn't make it into this translation. And so you see the beautiful description. Again, I could ask for a show of hands, but how many of you men out there, what you really want is a wife that you don't love? Of course not. How many of you women out there were really waiting so that you could marry a husband you didn't respect? Of course not. Husbands want a wife that they love. Women want a wife, or a husband, that they respect. That doesn't mean that husbands don't also respect their wives and wives don't also love their husbands. But you see, what Paul's describing in the end, even though at the beginning of this passage we may have felt a little uneasy because it was so politically incorrect to say what he said. In the end, Paul is describing a beautiful marriage that every one of us would love to have. And when those words describe our marriages or our 
our families or our workplace relationships, I can guarantee you that is a better evangelism program, a better missions trip than anything else you're ever going to hear of. If these words were to describe our marriages, if these words were to describe our families, and these words were to describe our workplace relationships, then I have to believe the name of Christ would be honored and rejoiced in by all who hear it. And so, if we are to put off the old and put on the new, as we talked about two weeks ago, if we are to walk as children of the light, then let it be our prayer that husbands will love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her, and that wives would respect, care for, and submit themselves to their husbands. And the same prayer for parents and children, for bosses and employees. So that this incredible gift, this new life, that Christ has freely poured out on us, might pour forth in all of our relationships, in all that we do, so that he may be glorified. Not a single one of us is going to succeed 100% at this task. I've just set before you a goal that you can work toward the rest of your life. And that's why we thank God that this comes at the end of Ephesians, not the beginning. Paul has already made it clear, you have been given the gift of Christ. Christ has called you his own, sons and daughters, joint heirs with Jesus. Now, we can live that out in humility and love and respect. Whether in our marriages, or in our relationships with parents or children, or in our workplaces, wherever you go, you can live out this incredible truth of Christ's self-sacrificial love, his submission, his care for all the world. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds firmly in your faith in Christ Jesus our Lord.